Kyle, you do know that, like, you're to blame. You fucking chose this book. Yeah, I know. I chose the book. I selected it. And I, I stand by the value of reading it, even if I curse myself for making that decision. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the 131st episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Friday, 4th of September, 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Today we are joined by our Emancipation Network comrades, Kyle and Shane, from the General Intellect Unit, to discuss Paul Burkett's Marx and Nature, a Red and Green Perspective. This is the first part of an epic three-parter, which will be released over the coming weeks. I have the new patrons to thank, Trash Ben, Slavic Dreams, and Michael. If you like the show, perhaps you too could become a patron. Patrons get two patron-only episodes and two live streams every month, the regular episodes a few days early, the right to vote in the next reading group series. Okay, enough commie grifting. Let's join the discussion. This time we are here to talk about a book called Marx and Nature, a red and green perspective by Paul Burkett. As I was saying in the Discord, this this book it's it's quite good, but it did make me want to become illiterate because it's 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 so fucking long and it's such a goddamn drag to read. But a fair chunk of the content is actually quite good. Kyle, what's your what's your take on this? No, I, I completely agree. Uh, I mentioned before recording that I felt like I was being browbeaten the entire time <laughs> I read this book. Like, just, like, get it in your head. Marx is not against ecology. Uh, uh, so, uh, I understand, like, you know, it was written, what, in the late 90s? So this is, like... Everything has swung hard against Marxism at this point, right? This is Marxism at an all-time low when Burkett is writing this book. And I can understand why he takes this browbeating approach. Because he has to insist on something being true when the intellectual environment around him would have been incredibly hostile and looking for any kind of weasel excuse to slander Marx with things that he didn't say. Or to just say that everything you saw in the Soviet Union, everything is part of like 20th century state socialism is just lockstep with Marx's point of view. And that's the end of the story. Let's close the books on, on Marxism and let's move on. So I understand where this is coming from. It doesn't make it an enjoyable read. It's, it's, it's a real slog. And as somebody who has read a lot of Marx and read a lot of books about communism, sort of prospective views of communism, most of the stuff that Burkett is bringing up in this book was already familiar to me. So the degree of repetition the degree of just kind of like belaboring points was truly exhausting. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Exhausting is is certainly the word for it. Um, I I found it to be like, uh, I mean, there's there's some good stuff in there. A lot of it was pretty familiar. And in some ways it's like even worse because I'm already sold on the argument. Like I kind of, I kind of had a general feeling this was the case anyway. And it's like, you don't, you don't have to pitch quite as hard when that's the case. I did think that like, maybe, yeah, the context of it being from the early nineties is probably pretty important that so in, in one sense this is very like academic work it's very much like an academic counter, counter argument sort of thing but i could also imagine it being pitched at eco folks as like baby's first marks and it's perhaps a little too heavy for that kind of like very easy introduction thing but like a, a thorough explanation and thorough quoting of of Marx to make it really reiterate that point that no, Mar- Marx is fine with ecology, that this, this stuff does fit, the jigsaw does fit together, you don't have to worry about it, is maybe something for those people. Maybe as a psyop shit. Yeah. Maybe as a psyop. Because so that they'll never ever read Marx again. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the thing is, like, this helped clarify for me some points that Burkett addresses which are sort of common attacks on marxism 
like from the sort of greens, from ecological thinkers. And I do appreciate that a lot. I think that probably the book could be adapted into a baby's first Marxist ecology book, which would be written by someone with a little bit of a, uh, you know, more lively touch than Burkett. But, you know, if you want to, like, look up something in terms of, like, well, what did Marx say about this? This is a really good book because it's, like, very to the point, you know, It's hard to miss anything in this book because it's going to belabor everything like three times. (laughs) So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good reference book, but again, I, I, I agree. I don't think it is, I don't think it is that book that you would give to your environmentalist activist friend to sort of explain to them what Marx had to say about ecology because it's just, it's it's very much in the trenches of academic fighting. It's a, it's a slugfest. It's it's not a a thing of beauty. I would say like uh, I've got two stories about being on on Irish islands. Like about two years ago, I was on Clare Island off in uh, off Mayo, and I was camping uh, on the beach, and there was like there was some kind of like like hippie storytelling kind of uh, festival on there or something. And there was this woman. She was. She's really friendly, she's nice, she cooked me some porridge, but she was, I said I would do the podcast on Marx, and then she basically gave all these eco critiques that he deals with in here. And, and yeah. that, that is, I think that's pretty standard among kind of Extinction Rebellion types. Uh, I, I'd say that this book, you know, the arguments in it could be put to good use against some of the stuff that is so common. The other one I get is about, I was, on, I was up on uh, Aaron Moore there off Donegal, and I was driving a car on the island, and uh, I was reading the book and I put the book, before I got in, I had put the book on the roof of the car and uh, I drove off with the, with the book on the roof of the car and we're driving along and about a mile, a mile we're kind of going and then I saw, I saw in the mirror back there, I saw something fly off the back of the roof. I was like, what was that? And like, uh, uh, someone's in the back says, oh, I didn't see that. Precious Miss was like, I didn't see that. I was like, oh, I don't know. It felt like, like a body fell off the roof of the car or something. So I was driving along anyway. And then like about a minute later, this like person in the car was like, beep, 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 the horn driving up. And I was like, what's going on here? You know, and I stopped the car and got out. She was like, she's waving the book. She says, here, you dropped this book. I was like, you know, God was trying to tell me something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the planet. <laughs> <laughs> read this my, my psyche was saying like I can't fucking put up with this I'm leaving on the roof <laughs> and the planet said no, no read the book <laughs> well yeah and I, I think like you know reading this book it is clear to me in perhaps a way it, it hadn't been before the only way we could plausibly address the ecological problems we're facing the civilizational problems we're facing is communism like, it's just very obvious, you know, you, like, he does lay out in a very clear way, like, this is the basic logic of why capitalism simply cannot address these problems in an indefinite sense, right? It, it, it's like, no, the, this is just necessary. Like, there, there's no real budge room on that. I don't know. I, I'm less hardcore on those critiques maybe we'll get to them in a while but I think you're right as in that the tension between nature and capital is like he squ- he rightly puts squarely on the value form which sounds like a real wank wanker kind of a <laughs> an explanation you know it sounds like oh it's the value form man it's the value form but truly like at the at the at the crux of the debate is literally the split between use value and exchange value or value, whatever you want to call it, use value and and value. And it's that key thing. Like I was doing a Marxist, like a capital reading group, you know, and I kind of felt like I was, you know, a crazed lunatic, the way I keep saying to people, there it is again. It's a use value versus value. That's the problem, man. You know, and and literally that's like, that's this book is basically just keeps coming at you and going, use value, value. And it hammers it into your brain. And like, I think one of the reasons we, well, I think the reason we, we decided to do this show was I was complaining about one of your, one of your ones. What one was it? Uh, the Moor one. Moor, and, yeah. And there was stuff in that where they were giving, uh, they were saying, I can't remember now, so maybe I misheard, but that was at the time I was I was upset. It was like, it was saying that the problem with Marx is that he doesn't value 
natural stuff. There was some stuff like that, that the natural processes aren't being valued. And I think this book really picks apart that that critique amongst, like I, probably that's the, the most important critique that there is there to be had in this book. So it does, yeah, this, this reading did come out of your response to Moore and the way we covered Moore. I think, you know, at the time it was... Basically, Moore was making a technical mistake or a technical error in uh, his approach to value theory, which I can't remember the specifics of because it was months ago. <laughs> we could go back through the chat logs and look at it. Uh, thankfully, uh, might have to might have to do a little insert here to explain what exactly that was. But I think you know, coming out of this book, reading this book. I think it definitely presents Burkett and Bellamy Foster's position in a much better way than their critiques of Moore did. Their critiques of Moore were not convincing. But this book does actually, it's actually more convincing. And I think that, you know, coming away from it, I have a better appreciation of the way that Marx understood humanity as a part of nature and the relationship between nature, production, technology, all of these things in, in a much more subtle way. So I've learned that. I think the only thing that I take away from more that I think that this book doesn't really quite get is the emphasis that Moore puts on capital reshaping nature for capitalist ends. There's a lot of emphasis in this book on over-exploitation of nature or destruction of nature, but I don't think that Marx or Burkett uh, really have the same appreciation of the ways in which capital can remake nature to capitalist again. So we get a little bit of a mention it in here with stuff like GMOs, but it doesn't have the historical scope or depth of what Moore brings up. But I also think that there's no reason why you couldn't combine these things. Like, there, there's, there's no there's no insurmountable thing that, like, you couldn't add for Moore into this. It, it feels like the whole debate is a little bit of a tempest in a teacup. And I, I know Bob said that, and it wasn't quite as clear to us, having read Moore and then reading uh, Bellamy Foster's rejoinder, because Bellamy Foster's rejoinder was really bad. But having read this book, I'm like, oh yeah, no, there's like, there's more going on here. It can accommodate a lot of Moore's critiques. There's maybe just a few little additions that need to be made, and we can proceed from a solid basis in Marx's value theory and Marx's uh, own writings on ecology. Well, one thing I would say is like, I haven't read those critiques and I haven't done the Moore stuff. It was just from your podcast. What I, I would say is like that it'd be interesting to reread the critiques again in the light of having read the book. Because I, I do remember one time I was, uh, I had some like scientific magazine, like Scientific American magazine or something. And it was like, they had two competing articles on uh, consciousness. And I read like the first one, I was like, okay. And I read the second one, I was like, oh, the second one, I was like, she totally destroyed the guy's arguments in the first one. I was like, wow, like she totally minced him. And then my mate was there who was a psychologist, like a professor of psychology, and he, he read them and he was going, oh, no, no, no. The first, the first person totally won that argument. And he went through all the points with me. And I was like, by the end, I was like, yeah, God, I was, I was kind of, I was quite shocked. I was like, how did I think the second person had won that argument? And I looked back, I was like, you know, so I don't know whether that is the case here, but like certainly that has happened to me in the past. So mm -hmm, I, I think for like with certainly what you're saying about Moore is correct that it seems to be like an emphasis. There is stuff in here on destruction of forests and how that comes out of the value form, but uh, et cetera, et cetera. But like, uh, but it's certainly not an emphasis. I think there might be one or two fleeting quotes up by Marx about uh, how it reshapes. I, 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 I'm thinking about like the way that Moore describes, for example capitalism's ability to create like plantation ecologies which are amenable to accumulation right and like marx kind of gets at that a bit and so does burkett but moore is very focused on this point as being something that is 
continuous throughout the history of capitalism. And I think that that is a very well taken point that like, yeah, capitalism does create its own uh, accumulation focused ecosystems. Um, yeah. 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 100%. Cool. So the, gen- the general theme of the book is kind of trying to like basically prove that like, hey, look, all this ecology stuff actually is either present in the writings of Marx and Engels either explicitly or kind of implicitly, or it's not incompatible at the very least, right? That like, there is a very, very solid basis for doing an eco-Marxist read. It's not like a hodgepodge. It is actually there in the source material. And it's not subtext. It is text in the writings of Marx and Engels. Yeah. And, and this is this is more convincing to me than anything I've ever read from Bellamy Foster on that point. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, perhaps it's because of the sheer length of it and the, the browbeating. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, the the author divides it up into kind of three sections. So part one is nature and historical materialism, where he's kind of going over the theoretical foundations of it. Part two is nature and capitalism, where it's kind of weaving in the re- the relation the, the relation of capitalism to nature. And then part three is nature and communism, the relation between Marx's communism and nature. So, be, so it's ecology and capitalism, and then ecology and communism. That part three is actually quite good, and I think we'll dwell on it for a fair bit, uh, particularly the last two chapters. Because it's, it's much more positive, and it's more positive than the Moore was. The Moore is kind of like describing a lot of problems, but doesn't finish on a particularly high note. But um, this book does finish on a fairly high note. And for the rest of it, we'll, we'll kind of like go over the greatest hits of the concepts rather than paragraph by paragraph, because it's absolutely fucking excruciating to go through it that way. Um, so <laughs> We're getting a good sell here, aren't we? How many copies will be sold after this interview? <laughs> These three that we have. <laughs> Look, we're not here to sell books. No. Um, this isn't the Zero Books podcast. Yeah, yeah that's right. We have no like, publisher yeah. relationships yeah. on General Intellect Unit. we got to get into that grift. Yeah. It never probably will. It never probably will. We're too honest. After this episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'd be that'd be a hell of a grift though, because you'd you'd have to start like you'd have to interview all the authors and all that kind of stuff, and like I don't know. Anyway, so Kyle, like, what's the what's the kind of summary of part one? Like the the couple of these these first couple of chapters. What's going on here? Okay, so this is laying the theoretical groundwork for the analysis of capitalism and then the analysis of communism. So the first part requirements of social ecology proceeds in a very non-Marxist way to sort of lay out analytically what does it mean to have a social ecology? Like, what are the requirements that have to be met to to say that you have a social ecology so that we have a metric by which to measure Marx's statements? Right. That's that's what's going on here. Uh, so he says, by setting forth some basic analytical criteria, this chapter establishes the ecological usefulness of Marx's materialist approach to history, capitalism and communism. The four requirements of a social ecology provide a structure from which some crucial elements of Marx's approach can be informally introduced as an overview for the subsequent chapters. So, again, the the stink of analytical Marxism is heavy in this prose. Now, you know, credit to him provides very clear criteria by which to evaluate the work and follows through on it. It just it doesn't read well. So, um, okay. I propose a game before we get into this. One of us will pick a random page. One of us will pick a line, and then the other person will have to read out that sentence. Just as an an example of how bad this is. Right. Okay. Sure. Let's do it. All right. Ah, okay. Yeah, got it, got it, got it. All right. But synthetic commodities and throughput do fit into Marx's analysis of capital's powerful tendency to divide and simplify labor and nature in general disregard of the ecological interconnections required for the reproduction of natural wealth of any given quality. That's the whole fucking book. The That's the whole book. book. Like that. The entire book is made up of this, this form, though, of like, X does fit into Marx's Y. 
That's the yeah, entire. It's analytical. Yeah. It's analytical. It's <laughs> analytical. Uh, I'm telling you, this is, this is what it is. Okay. But let's, okay. So analytically speaking, what are the four requirements? The first requirement, it must be consistently social and materialist. Okay. On the one hand, it should treat people, nature relations as socially mediated in historically specific ways, thus avoiding crude materialist whether technological determinist or naturist conceptions of social reality as being naturally predetermined. On the other hand, it should not follow into a social constructivist view, one-sidedly emphasizing the role of social forms in shaping human history to the neglect of material content of these forms as constrained by the natural conditions of human production and evolution. So what does that say? Social and materialist ecology needs to a not be jared diamond just kind of like natural conditions determine everything and two it doesn't it shouldn't be you know kind of uh post-modernist just everything is socially determined there is no material component to history okay that's requirement number one now where's requirement number two okay it's relational holism right okay Social ecology should also utilize a holistic yet differentiated and relational approach to human production. Although holism is needed to conceptualize the natural conditions and limits of a total system of material production, differentiation is necessary to capture the dynamics. So, you know, this is just kind of saying like basic systems theory stuff, right? Yeah, like yeah. if you're going to do ecology, it has to be systematic. It has to be holistic. Point three Qualitative and quantitative analysis. Social ecology should give equal weight to qualitative and quantitative concerns. Fair enough. I mean, that's just ecology, right? It, it, it do. <laughs> it should. <laughs> and pedagogical potential. The development of society's self-critical and self-transformative capabilities, so important for the transition to a concordant co-evolution of society and nature, is determined largely in and through people's struggles for decent working and living conditions. So he says, From this perspective, the problem of social ecology becomes one of developing analytical tools that can be used not only by professional ecologists and social scientists, but also by popular sectors, students, labor and environmental activists, and general working class readers. So it should not just be analytical, it should be useful. Okay, so those are the four requirements. There you go. That's chapter one. It's a weird chapter. Wow. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, like, and the other structure of the book is sometimes you'll say at the start of a chapter, this chapter is going to be about this. I will make these arguments about it, and I will come use these arguments to come to this conclusion. And then you'll say, okay, let me repeat those arguments. And then or I'll repeat the solution, and then I will say, summary, I have now shown... And you repeat it all over again. That's the general structure of the book. Maybe it's optimized for like grad school reading, where you can some you can skim the entire book by reading the first and last paragraphs of each chapter. Like that's, you know. <sighs> okay, uh, chapter two. So like, I I don't know. Are we, is it even going to be fruitful for us going through these chapters? Do you think, or should we talk generically? I just want I just want to clarify what they're about. Yeah, like sure. because he's laying out the framework of historical materialism here, so it's just okay. worth saying what it is. Chapter two: Nature, labor, and production. To understand how Marx incorporates natural conditions into his analysis of capitalism, it is necessary to first consider the place of nature in Marx's materialist conception of history. This chapter provides a broad outline of the natural and social elements in Marx's historical materialism. Whereas chapters three and four present in detail Marx's treatment of natural and human productive forces. So what is the role of nature in historical materialism? And he's going to basically point out that humanity is a part of nature, but it also stands in an antithetical relationship to nature. Because, you know, we have a certain kind of social consciousness and social productive process that sets us apart from other natural beings. There's more to it than that, but I don't want to spend too much more time on this. The only thing I would say is that maybe Marx and Burkett 
overemphasize the degree to which humans are exclusively the social animals. Because there, there are other social animals that meet all those criteria. It's just, you know, humans are maybe the most obvious ones to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, of the re- one of the important concepts that's introduced here is that nature, like, na- both nature and labor contribute to wealth. Uh, yeah. Yes. And w- wealth is not identical to value. Uh, but if w- wealth is the thing we're concerned about, it's a cooperation. L- well, like, I kind of like labor operating on nature and cooperating with nature to produce wealth that is meaningful to human beings. And, but it, it also foregrounds some of the like in, inhuman productions, uh, like that like labor is a specific kind of productive activity, that there is, na- uh, like nature and even the universe are productive in general, but like life is self-producing, it's auto-poetic, but that labor is the human activities that corral these productive forces specifically, so that like labor is a subset of production. Which is an it's a important distinction to introduce up front, and is one that's kind of glom- glossed over in a lot of Marx's kind of Marxist writing, rather than Marx's writing as such. Right, and you know, for example, like Marx talks about how in agriculture there is a certain amount of turnover time where nature is just doing its thing, and you just have to wait for that process to happen. That is part of the production process. But it's not labor time because there's no human working there. It's still productive of use values. And ultimately, the humans can turn that into a commodity through labor and selling on the market. But yeah, there's a distinction, but nature is still productive. It's not exclusively yeah. humans. And it doesn't add value. That's the big thing. Yes. Like, so like... What's weird is like, and he, he gets into it very well. I know we're probably jumping around the place here, but like value, the way we think about like monetary numbers on say GDP and stuff like that, that's a measure purely of human produced wealth. You know, it's a measure of wealth that's been produced, labor time produced. So there's all this other wealth in the world. Capitalism does not calculate it at all. So we have like this single point estimator that's been used to say how good our society is. And it's only taken a human labor point of view, which if you think about it, it's crazy. Like you probably, if you wanted to list, like I remember when I was doing, I was doing a capital reading group and I was asking people like, so what, 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 what are, would be good things in society? Say, oh, less CO2 or less toxins, less plastics, you know, uh, more free time. Like the, the, the calculation that's going on in, in capitalism does not give it one hoot about any of that. It literally only cares about that human, you know, how much human labor have we actually produced this year? And that's that's kind of it. And in commodities specifically, right? Because yeah. it's, it's only commodity labor that that shows up in. So it's, um, I was going to say like it's a half-blind metric, but it's much more than half-blind. It's it's almost entirely blind to the variety of, of the world and to the variety of productive living systems. All of that gets condensed into the single metric that's a very narrow measure of a very narrow band of living experience but it's it's the living experience that matters to the system so it's the one that gets counted and this is really important for burkett because that sort of antithesis or that antithesis between all the varieties of use value in the world versus the sort of purely scalar quantitative nature of value like in, in capitalism is really what makes it so that we can only actually reckon with nature as something that must be managed and integrated with when we transcend capitalism. Because otherwise, in every situation, that value concern, which is totally antithetical to all of like the real things that we experience sensuously in nature, is going to override our considerations, right? It, it, it's going to be the ultimate be all and end all is going to be well profitability, well value expansion. That's what really matters. Okay, so uh, chapter three, the natural basis of labor productivity and surplus labor. So Burkett introduces this here, he says, Despite the oft-made charge that he downgrades nature's contribution to production, Marx places great emphasis on the natural basis of labor productivity, both transhistorically and under capitalism. Not only is labor power itself a natural force, 
But material wealth, the world of use values, exclusively consists of natural materials modified by labor. Different use values contain very different proportions of labor and natural products, but use value always contains a natural element. It follows that the productivity of labor, the ability of human beings to produce use values in and through society, must be conceptualized in terms of definite natural conditions. So here he's locating the labor process and the human social production process within a natural context and like emphasizing this is happening in nature. We can't just think about the production process as it exists in the relationship between the worker and the capitalist, right? And the value production. We have to remember that all of that happens in a natural context. And like this, this is kind of specifically the, 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 like the surplus means of subsistence and it's ultimately agriculture, right? It's photosynthesis is the, the bedrock of all of these processes. So that like capitalism or the, the, the harvesting of surplus value would be impossible without surplus means of subsistence, which means that like if you were in a scenario where your social organisms were basically getting precisely the energy and nutrition input that they needed to simply reproduce with no surplus whatsoever, none of that stuff would be possible. And that's the basis for all of the surplus is agriculture and efficiency in agriculture that makes it makes it possible to perform more activity in a day than it takes to feed yourself to replenish exactly the cost of that activity. There has to be a surplus at that biophysical level, even at the thermodynamic level, right? Once the sun, sun burns out and there's no heat arriving on the earth, it, it's, it's definitely game over for this surplus value accumulation. No, no. What we'll do, Shane, is we'll just we'll go to alternative energy sources. <laughs> <laughs> like void energy or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. We'll then go and use the weak or, nuclear force. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> or do what they do in the culture and just tap into like the grid of the universe. There's like there's like a there's like an array of cells below the quantum level, and you just like pluck energy out of them. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is straightforward and convincing stuff. It's yeah. I mean, if there's if there's no biophysical surplus, and if there's no material to operate on, yeah, shrug. It's all over. And and so. going back to our four requirements for a social ecology. This is sort of like emphasizing when we talk about Marxist value theory, this is a materialist discussion, even if we are talking about a system that tends naturally towards idealism, right? Like the, 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 the capitalist understanding of accumulation because of sort of commodity fetishism and all that sort of tends naturally towards idealism. But when Marx describes this whole thing, he is describing it from a materialist standpoint that is compatible with natural science. Because the, the, the abstraction of, of capitalist value and all these kind of like crazy idealist things is a symbolic manipulation of a physical, of a biophysical surplus. Yeah. It's, it's symbolic manipulation of things that are represented, even if they're represented in the, in the most crazed and abstract and distorted fashion, there's still a kind of like, it, it has to reduce to some sort of physical activity because otherwise there's no symbolic activity possible. Right. Okay. So final chapter of this section is labor and labor power as natural and social forces. So he introduces this one. For Marx, labor is the creative subjective factor uh, in production conceived as a necessary part of the material metabolism between people and nature. Individual and collective human labors take place and evolve in and through definite social relations. Human production is thus constituted jointly by social production relations and the material characteristics of nature itself. So this is something that Bellamy Foster was at pains to emphasize in his response to Moore, right? To say, well, there's a there's a social dimension to this, and there's also a material dimension to this, and both of them matter. I think what we see here in this chapter and in this book, 
where like that point kind of makes more sense is that human production in a very real sense is social production. And we see that in like production for the market, production for exchange, socially necessary labor time being something that is validated only through a social process. Like the human species reproduces itself through cooperative labor one way or the other. Whatever mode of production we're in, there's a social dimension that is important and becomes increasingly important. And you can't just like flatten that reality down into a purely material process or a purely social process. Like that that antithesis between the social and the material is like meaningful in a real way. Because we're social animals, right? Like it's animals are natural, but we and, and other animals are social animals also. This is a particular way that some animal species organize themselves and coordinate their activities. And we do it through social, like symbolic exchange stuff. And then in various eras, the shape of this symbolic exchange take on, takes on different characters. And that if our social relations are mediated through class relations, like if, if, if class is the sociality that we do and perform every day, then that class relation, that social relation is going to impact every interaction we have with every other particle that we ever come into contact with, such as everything in nature. And it all, like it's, it's a very tidy way of explaining this like double looped circuit. That, like, yes, we are natural, but it is in our nature to, nature to be social. Yes. And we interact with nature, and because because we are social in nature, we interact with nature socially. It's quite tidy. And our social interaction with nature is historically contingent. Precisely. That meaningful. Like, it actually makes a difference. The, the material makes a difference to the social formation, and the social formation makes, it, makes a difference to the material. Well, this is this is why Marx is so critical of Robinson Crusoe, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> like this is why this is why Marx hates Robinson Crusoe so much. <laughs> is because he's like, what are you talking about? Like, human beings are social beings and interact with nature socially, not as atomized individuals, like Ra- Robinson Crusoe would suggest. If anybody wants to kind of go from that Robinson Crusoe thing to the extreme. I don't know if you remember this right-wing economist called Peter Schiff. Yeah. And he wrote a book at the time of the 2008 crash. It was like when I was like, used to read The Economist and somebody said, oh, this guy's good. And I, I bought his book. It's like, you know, how money works or something. And it was kind of like a, a story tale about fishes and how fishes used to be real and now they're like plastic fishes, you know, like gold book. And now it's like paper money. Oh my God, I read it. It's like 150 pages. It was like, it was the worst shit I've ever read it's like no joke in you you would give it to a six year old and I'd say they'd be able to pick holes in the shit left right and center it was fucking <laughs> dreadful so I, I just want to read a little bit of this like part where Burkett is uh, quoting Marx you know there's there's quotations for Marx interspersed throughout this whole thing I'm not going to like highlight them but he's speaking through Marx's voice here Human labor power or capacity for labor is to be understood as the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in a human being, which he exercises whenever he produces a use value of any description. This aggregate is a natural force insofar as it is subject to the physical and biological laws governing all of nature. Labor power exists only as a capacity or power of the living individual, as a definite quantity of human muscle, nerve, brain, etc. And as such, it is subject to wear and tear and must therefore perpetuate itself by procreation. While a certain mass of necessaries must be consumed by a man to grow up and maintain his life, another amount is required to bring up a certain quota of children. In order to maintain and reproduce itself, to perpetuate its physical existence, the working class must receive the necessaries absolutely indispensable for living and multiplying. These natural wants, such as food, clothing, fuel, and housing, vary according to climatic and other physical conditions. So, you know, Marx here is speaking about the human individual, 
the reproductive unit of humanity and the working class. And this is the way in which Marxist political economy differs fundamentally from neoclassical economics. Because neoclassical economics is not concerned with the basic fact of economy that material balances have to square in order to reproduce the species. Like that's, that's where classical political economy and Marxist political economy begins from. Like what is produced and what is consumed have to line up for the species to reproduce itself. Neoclassical economics is operating on an entirely different level of abstraction, which is just not concerned with this basic fact of, of survival and biological existence of the species. Yeah, absolutely. Which Marx, you know, begins from. And the, the last part of this chapter then is kind of like goes more into the like social natural metabolism, which is one of these kind of like other foundational concepts that social beings like operate on and within nature and there's like potential which is realized in capitalism for ever increasing divergence of the circuits and loops of one versus the circuits and loops of the other so that the human social system can kind of go nuts and spiral off into a crazy direction while the natural other natural systems kind of fail to keep up with the the change and that this is this is all historically contingent this co this coevolution is dynamic and real and each like each in, if it was a simulation each tick of the clock influences the next tick that happens and so on like it's none of these are given right that like natural conditions are not simply just there and human beings float around above them similarly the reverse isn't true either these are all intertwining constantly which i mean was also the bulk of what Moore was going on about as well and to just get to the the final point that Moore was outlined analytically for what a social ecology would need, is this useful to humanity in general? Yes, because historical materialist understanding allows us to transcend capitalism and therefore create a better life for ourselves. That's the fourth analytical condition fulfilled. Yeah, so that's section one of the book. We get more into the value-ish stuff in the next section, which I think is probably the, the bit that we're most interested in. Well, Kyle, that was really good. That was really good. That was like, you can tell that Kyle actually teaches a class. Well, you know, one positive thing I will say about, you know, Burkett laying this out analytically is you can use it as a lesson plan. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You've got your four points you need to hit. <laughs> So in chapter six, we get into the free appropriation of nature and so natural and social conditions, which is kind of one of the bones he has to pick with a lot of the folks that misinterpret Marx, right? That when Marx says free appropriation or like free gifts of nature, he doesn't mean like, oh, they're worthless. They're fucking useless things. Ah, you, just, you can do whatever the fuck you want with them. No, absolutely not. Um, it's free appropriation in the sense that it has a non-wage cost, that you the the alternative for getting your hands on them would to be be to pay wages to for somebody to go and fetch them or whatever like it's it's like the, it's the choice between like do you pay someone to go and pick some corn or whatever or do you pay someone to grow synthetic corn it's like no you, you clearly want the first one right like it's you don't want to assemble these fucking things molecule by molecule because that would cost a lot of labor time to do so and it's it's like it's the corn is freely appropriate appropriated in that you're not paying a wage cost to the corn itself you're paying a wage cost to the people who harvest it or so on and so forth, or wood, or whatever the fuck it is. That you're you're not paying the tree for its production for its production of itself. You're paying the the lumberjack for the labor time of cutting it down. That's the way it's free. Whereas assembling a tree from scratch will be fucking impossible because of the labor labor time involved. Even if you could do it, right? The the weasel move here is to say, oh, like it is to take the points where Marx is speaking from the standpoint of capital and claim that that is Marx's entire point. Correct. When in fact, you know, he's he's saying this is how capitalism thinks. This is how capitalism behaves. This is why it's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a voracious, ugly fucking system that has absolutely horrendous impacts on everything. It's not a sin to describe that. You're, you're not advocating for it by describing it. 
Yeah, like the whole thing is like so many of the eco critiques, like there's two basic problems with them, like and that's it. Either one, they accuse Marx this is like work of capital, they kind of make out it's normative. Like he's making that this is the way it should be. We should you know, well Marx is actually describing how capitalism is, this is actually how it operates. This is capitalism's logic. It's not it's not my logic, it's the way capital operates. And the other one is basically where they take a crude, non dialectical view of any statement Marx makes somewhere and they like they take it outside of its context. And certainly this one of value, like this to me is like kind of absolutely critical, like if we're trying to understand anything about why capitalism will inevitably lead to will at least lead to an economic uh, sorry an ecological crisis is this we, we don't need to value things that aren't don't have human labor simple as that you know it's the same reason if you walk down the if you go out my house here and you walk across to the ditch there are blackberries there they're growing for free they're free if i walk if i get in the car and I go into that boy and i buy a ton of blackberries that cost me two euro no fucking difference one of them has had no human labor in the other is his labor. And like, so this, this key error, I think, is a wash throughout most of the ecological stuff that, uh, that, that we read. And the stuff specifically critical of Marx. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right, Tom. The sort of uh, critiques that Burkett goes over throughout this book, like there's various uh, sort of like post-Marxist or e- ecological like green critiques of Marx that he brings up. They're of those two kinds. It's either when Marx describes something that capitalism does, he's describing an ought rather than an is. The second one is quoting Marx out of context and claiming that that's the be all and end all of what Marx said. And it just comes up again and again. It's those two types of things. Now, to be fair, you know, Burkett does a lot of legwork in assembling stuff that Marx wrote in this or that letter or it's in the Grundrisse, or it's, you know, in the back of Capital Volume 2, which no one has ever read. This is, uh, he does a lot of legwork to put this stuff together. So it's not, you know, always staring them in the face, and they're just blatantly misquoting it. But there is a lot of that that's going on. But, like, no joking you, like, most of the arguments that he makes in here are probably out of the first hundred pages of Capital. Yeah. Like... Like, no joking, like, but the, the core ideas of, like, value theory, the value form exchange versus use value, value versus use value. So communist planning, Marx even has some stuff about planning in, 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 like, in the first hundred pages. Yeah. And, like, so most of the, actually, the core critiques are in the first hundred pages. So, like, you know, I, I think most of it, most of those critiques, I think, are, it's hard not to see them as motivated critiques. Unless, unless, of course, like you could be a professor of fucking Marxist economics, ecology, and not understand the the fundamental basis of value theory. Don't get me wrong; like that's probably reasonably likely. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's absolutely possible because, like, you know, this is the thing where whenever somebody brings up a question about the value form or about exchange value, value use value, I go back and read the first chapter of Capital because there's <laughs> right there. so much stuff out there even from leftists that misrepresents what Marx said yeah it's very easy to get confused about this stuff because it's not because Marx is not clear it, he's talking about something that is, that is that is reasonably complex in clear language but you know you read the secondary sources and then the secondary sources of secondary sources and you just your head gets all muddled up. That's what definitely happens to me, right? Like where I kind of, I read through Capital and that, at least kind of, I read the quotations directly, read just out of, out of Capital Volume 1. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, this, this is good, right? And then, but then after a month or two, I've just been like stewing in fucking left articles and Marxist fucking bullshit and all these, this kind of bong rip takes and I'm, my brain is fucking scrambled. <laughs> and you have, to, you have to go back to the source to, to re-clarify things. Yeah, you, you, you have to unscramble your brain regularly because there's a lot of just, wrong stuff out there that and then and then wrong stuff erroneous statements that are cited as fact in secondary sources and then you have a whole literature you know tom you're the most familiar with this in the bait like in in looking (laughs) through the whole uh transformation (laughs) problem stuff right 
Like it's um, it's endemic. Yeah, but I think it's I do I do seriously think you know I'm a cynic. You know I I think like uh, you know I, you can't be too cynical enough. That's my general rule of thumb in the world. If somebody could be doing it cynically, I I I make money as I'm in the living as a poker player. I'll put my money on the art doing it cynically. That's the way I approach. You know I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying I will put money on it. <laughs> but like yeah, even like so you get to think. I remember there was a big furore over like Angela Nagel picking like Marx quotes about like you know the working class in England and the Irish and taking them out of like doing using those arguments out of context to say the opposite of point of what Marx was trying to say. Okay. And I just think that that's the type of shit that goes on in all the time. And in the economics field they just they just apply a use value fucking exchange. They just mix it all up to make any point they want. I think that's what's going on a lot of the time. It's whatever it needs needs to be to get you through the day. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.